everybody. Good evening. Good evening. It is hump day. It's Wednesday, the 19th. That's right, 19 days into July. We ha only have about another 45 days. We have only another 45 days left of July. Because you know there's always a week uh, There's always a week left in July. July and January, I always say it, there's always a week left. It doesn't matter how long you've been in there. It actually, it's pretty, it's pretty much like January 87th right now. Or however long it is. That's, that's, that's two little days. We're, we're more than 100 days away from January, but still, tonight is going to be a great one because we have a wonderful guest, wonderful guest, and it's the first time he's coming on the show. I'm hoping it is not the last because I have some great ideas for future discussions. His name, his pen name is Alaric the Barbarian, and he publishes a lot of his work. Not only on Twitter, which is a great way to interact with people and get things out there, but publishes at the Dissident Review. And they not only do wonderful things in blog, online form, but also they're in the print business as well. So um, he's going to be joining me tonight to discuss the myth of the Dark Ages. What do you know about the so-called Dark Ages? Because they are referenced a lot, aren't they? Oh, it's like the Dark Ages over here. Yeah, what was so dark about them? I mean, there's... You know. It was just very dark. And everybody was depressed. Because they didn't have Instagram. Everybody was depressed. They knew that they were another thousand or so years away from Instagram and what the hell was there. What was there to do? So tonight we're going to be discussing the... The Dark Ages. Which I can't wait to do. Because I have... Not only my own questions that I, had, that I want to follow along chronologically and, and get a nice foundation for this in, but I also have some great questions that were submitted by you, the audience. I put a Twitter question out there that people have been commenting on. I also have people commenting on the thread, uh, the threads that I mirrored on both Patreon and Subscribestar. <coughs> so... I know it's going to be great. There's going to be tons of places we can go and things we can do because ultimately, I think that we are really not that far off from the... I, don't, I think that there's a lot of things that are parallel to this so-called Dark Ages, at least in the way that it was reported. I think that perhaps maybe at the end of the night, there's a possibility that we'll see that although it was a time of great, great uh, transition and fluctuation of power and culture over there in Europe we're going through that a little bit right now but ultimately who tells the story of the histories and why is it told in a, in a certain way and why does it become so myopic why is it that it's just a hey, Rome fell and all of a sudden all the technology is gone all the culture is gone all the history is gone and suddenly it is just hundreds of years of religious tyranny from Christians and um, and, and and what else uh, feudalism is, is that really all it took Rome falling so I I, uh, I just want to ask some questions and learn a little something about history tonight and I think Alaric is a great guy to do that with so I hope you enjoy um, tomorrow night is Wednesday it's Thursday Reverend Bill Bean is on the show. As you know, we're going to be doing a little bit on exorcism and demonic possession. It's been a while since we did that. It'll be, I guess, another preview of the spooky season when when uh, it's time to start talking about things like this and Halloween and getting into the weeds again. Matt will be in on Friday the 21st, I think, with Shane Cashman on the line to talk about the Long Island serial killer. It won't be a long segment. Have him on around 7.25, 7.30. Just go to the top of the hour. Uh, just to, just to, uh, to to lay down some some bricks with somebody who was covering it when it was all happening. I mean, I, we knew the headlines about all the bodies found, the 11 people dead. Uh, and that was so long ago at, at this point, like 13 years ago. I remember the headlines. But, um, but as far as following this from a true crime perspective... 
we'll have a little bit with Shane Cashman and then maybe some of your calls as well. It's Friday night, so there's plenty of places to to improvise. Next week is going to be great. Is what we're going to be talking about electroculture next week. We're going to, we have a professional remote viewer coming on with military experience. Oh, you know, they're, they're going to have to hire a couple of more remote viewers to do something militarily. I heard what's going on at that Pentagon with the uh, with all the transgender service members that, that are allowed to skip deployments and receive indefinite physical fitness waivers. As, as, as we knew, we knew that, you know, talk about combat readiness, but so many more things. Ryan Gable is confirmed for August 2nd. It's a Wednesday, August 2nd. So in about two weeks, he'll be coming on to talk about the link between, you know, the, the, you know, the link between the Oppenheimer release and this Barbie, this plastic Barbie release, but also just a little bit more on Oppenheimer and the, the bomb and yeah, just uh, all the types of people and research and the groups influencing that, um, that project and where we are now. That's going to be a really awesome deep dive. It's been a while since we had Ryan Gable on the show. It's been many months, so can't wait for that. So that's it. That's it. There's so much more, but I can't give you every day until September the guests that are coming on. Just keep checking the website, and we're going to have those guests updated as time goes on. Thank you to Blue Monster Prep for being our sponsor tonight and every night. BlueMonsterPrep.com. Ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't spoken to Pat and Gina, you need to. If you haven't spoken to them in a while, you should. Again. And just uh, go over the things you have and make sure that you don't need, you don't want for anything. Especially when that time comes when the pressure is on. The pressure will be a little bit more bearable for you and yours. All right. Did I say it's the 19th today? I hope I did. I feel like I might have said the 18th a couple of times, but it's the 19th. (laughs) And, And away we go. All right, into the grab bag. Let's do a couple of things here to get ourselves nice and sharp for the rest of tonight's show. First one up. Oh, it's that same exact thing I was talking about. Biden DOD. Let transgender service members skip deployments. There you go. There you go. You can say, I'm an army person, even though uh, you don't get to go fight all the wars. But, you know, you get to wear the uniform and the the Pentagon will pay for your uh, your penis mutilation. The dossier, this was in a confidential memo, the dossier, physical fitness waivers as well. The dossier has acquired a new Department of Defense memo that has, uh, that goes straight to the detail of, on the topic of care of service members who identify as transgender. The document, which is not classified but has long remained unavailable to Americans, is being published here for the first time for public consumption. The 34-page memo details enormous perks granted to service members who identify as transgender. At the beginning of his tenure, President Biden ended Trump's ban on people who identify as transgender serving in the military. Since then, the Biden administration has granted more and more benefits to this cohort. So here are some of the highlights found in the document. Taxpayer-funded care for transgender service members include speech and voice therapy because they have to practice their fake voice when they're pretending to be a girl. Cross-sex hormones. Laser hair removal. Voice feminization surgery. Oh, my gosh. Facial contouring. Body contouring. Breast and chest surgery. These are supposed to be battle-ready individuals who are ready to go out there and kill the nation's enemies. And instead, they are. Go- it, it might just be a a military, a, a really, a really um, public relations friendly way of recruiting people for military experiments. These, this is all the stuff that the Nazis and the and the and the Japanese were doing that we all say was horrible, sewing twins together and everything else. That we all we we gasp at the things that they were doing to people. But maybe this is really just a very PR friendly way of performing medical tests and all that on 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 the mentally ill. Psychological counseling, genital mutilation surgery service members who identify as transgender may receive a waiver for grooming and uniform standards. Service members who identify as transgender may receive an indefinite waiver for physical fitness standards. Yeah, especially if you you cut away most of your chest. 
This waiver often becomes a de facto permanent situation, and the transgender identifying service member just has to renew the exemption every six months. And then finally, service members who identify as transgender will be considered a non-deployable for up to 300 days while taking hormones for their transition period. Again, given these hormones are often required for life, this may render the transgender identifying person as permanently unable to deploy. Don't worry, don't worry, they'll, they'll be made in generals. They'll be made generals. That's it. They don't need to go get kids. What are they going to do? Go into uh, go into the field for a couple of couple of months, and then what? With in, in all that sand, what do you do with the axe wound b- b- between your legs? It's an open wound that you have to constantly make because it, it, it's the body. The body is constantly saying, "Oh, damn, we are wounded here. We've got to fix this." Why do you think that the upkeep is forever? Because your body is constantly trying to heal itself from the damage that's being caused. That is now sponsored by the Pentagon. And you and I, unfortunately. So, you want to talk about dark ages? This is a good thing to cover. All right, what else do we have over here? U.S., the Daily Star. Oh, no, wait, one more from Zero Hedge. It's related to the Daily Star one. National Security Head says UFOs have a real, are having a real impact on United States Air Force pilots. Here's uh, John Kirby, another butcher murderer. Ahead of a major hearing scheduled to take place in the House next week, National Security Council Coordinator John Kirby told reporters on Tuesday that UFOs are having a real impact on the ability of U.S. Air Force pilots to operate. We wouldn't have stood up stood up an organization on the Pentagon to analyze and try to collect and coordinate the way these sightings are reported if we didn't take it seriously, Kirby said. I mean, some of these phenomena we know have already had an impact on our training ranges for, you know, when pilots are out trying to train in the air and they see these things. They're not sure what they are. It could have an impact on their ability to perfect their skills. So it already had an impact here, Kirby said, admitting that the military does not know what they are. Incredible that the Oppenheimer movie is coming out around now because, you know, if you really go into the lore about this, whether it's UFOs, whatever you think their origin are, if it is purely demonic, spiritual, interdimensional, or if we're talking about intergalactic, that kind of buoy, that buoy, that that, that signal flare that had gone off that people, uh, some people theorize about that I actually am really warm to that theory has to do about the coming of the atomic age and whether or not that was a little opening in the doorway to the so-called upside down or anywhere else the black lodge really interesting how all these things just couple together and obviously this has been building up for a while the ufo thing so still they're reporting on it with great seriousness now it's it's interfering with the way that our air force pilots are training he says, now we're not saying what they are or what they're not. We're saying that, that there's something our pilots are seeing. We're saying it has had an effect, uh, effect on some of our training operations, and so we want to get to the bottom of it. We want to understand it better. Sounds a lot like a lot of mealy-mouthed nonsense that is a wait-and-see-what-we-got-for-you-next moment. Maybe it's something that we'll be able to talk about with Ryan Gable in the coming weeks. Who knows where we're going to be in by August 2nd. And then we have this, the U.S. Marine, who exposed UFO encounter, claims he's being threatened by men in black. Former U.S. Marine Corps rifleman Michael Herrera says his house is being regularly buzzed by unmarked helicopters, which he thinks are connected to the the black-clad soldiers that threatened his life in Indonesia. Former U.S. Marine, who sensationally claimed that his unit stumbled across a secret military rendezvous with an alien spacecraft, says he's been threatened, even fears that one day he could be killed by sinister forces that are trying to cover up the Pentagon UFO secrets. Michael Herrera was part of a U.S. Navy humanitarian mission during the 2009 Sumatra earthquake. After he was ambushed by a paramilitary unit, he was searched and had his camera confiscated by mysterious soldiers in black. He was warned several times not to tell anyone about the strange flying saucer-type craft he had seen in the Sumatran jungle. After remaining silent about his strange encounter for many years, he told his story last month at a briefing given by Dr. Stephen Greer's Disclosure Project. 
He has now told podcaster Sean Ryan that the intimidation from shadowy forces within the United States military has increased. I've had numerous encounters with helicopters hovering over my house. They were hovering over my dad's house too, Michael said. They got so low that they were they would rattle the walls and scare the shit out of the animals that we've got. My dad's dogs were going crazy at that point and he was concerned because he was home and he was uh, he was like I've never heard anything like that. Michael said he shot video footage of the unmarked black helicopters and knows that other UFO whistleblowers, even people within the United States government, have been subjected to the same kind of intimidation tactics. So more more fun on that front here's another front i got for you here is another front the heat map you might have seen it not only are they telling giving us more and more reasons to stay out of the water stay out of the ocean there's sharks all over the place i just saw another somebody uh, shared a uh, a recently uploaded clip of another japanese man who was attacked by dolphins dolphin so Dolphins now, well, though we know the dolphins have a mean streak too. They're very intelligent. They're very friendly for the most part, but they'll also rape you. So there's that. Um, anyway, aside from all of the cautionary tales about going into the ocean or under the, the water, deep sea diving, whatever it is, there's also this incessant reporting on the heat, even though the summer doesn't even show up until June now, or I mean the summer weather. Your mind might be overheating. Here's a new one from heatmap.news. How heat waves strain our mental health. Much of the southern United States is in an extended heat wave with no end in sight until at least the end of the month. Phoenix, Arizona just experienced its 19th consecutive day of heat over 110 degrees Fahrenheit on Tuesday. Setting a new record, people are getting third-degree burns from the pavement. Even in comparatively mild Connecticut, country star Jason Aldean recently fled the stage due to heat stroke. Really? In Connecticut? But the extreme and prolonged heat of a warming world is not just a threat to our physical health. It's also trying, trying us psychologically. Whether you're lucky enough to be cooped up inside, handcuffed to your air conditioner, or forced to brave the outdoors. A 2018 study looked at the correlation between heat waves and deaths by suicide and found that monthly suicide rates more than, uh, arose more than 2% during, due to temperature in the hottest months between 1968 and 2004. Oh man, they've got a statistic for everything, don't they? The authors also collected more than 600 million Twitter posts published over the course of about a year, beginning in May of 2014, and found more instances of depressive language like lonely, trapped, suicidal when temperatures rose. Yeah, what about in March? What about in March when we're to, uh, in May when we're when we're still just completely over the winter weather? How about that one? Just as oh, you know, we're, it could it be. Could it be that it's easier to deal with the weather, A, if we're living in more temperate zones, and B, if we have other uh, areas in our life taken care of? Everything is, this has to all be, it can't just be about numbers on the dial. It can't just be about numbers on the dial. It has to be a health crisis because then there's a reason, there's a reason outside of the fact that, oh, it's hot in the summer, there is a, a bigger reason why the central authority has to come in and make sure that we do something about this. Do something about this. Even though they're making euthanate, you would think that making people suicidal would be something that uh, would be welcome at this point. They're pushing people who are not even terminally ill in Canada to kill themselves all the time by the, by the hand of the state. So what are they really getting at here? Do they, do they really care that much about us? No. Always remember that. They don't care. Anyhow. Let's start this one off. I hope wherever you are, it is, it's mild and you're able to relax. Perhaps some of you are watching this from poolside and I'm on some iPad on the deck and you're on a, you're in a tube drinking a Bahama Mama. That sounds really great. Or a Pina Colada. I'll take one of those right now. But, um, anyway, enjoy the rest of the evening. It's going to be great. We'll have Alaric the Barbarian coming on just after this. Help me something real quick. Share the show. 
Share it. The live links are all over the place. I tweeted them out. I shared them. I truthed them. I gabbed them. All of it. Get it on out there. If you're watching on YouTube, if you're watching on Rumble, light that candle. Give me a thumb. Give me a like. Walk through the door. You turn on the switch. That's it. It's a nanosecond. And if you haven't noticed, we are almost at 99,000 subscribers on on, uh, YouTube. Let's hit 100K finally before the inevitable happens. Thank you guys and gals so much. We will be right back. You let one ant stand up to us, then they all might stand up. Those puny little ants outnumber us a hundred to one. And if they ever figure that out, there goes our way of life. It's not about food. It's about keeping those ants in line. That's why we're going back. Does anybody else want to stay? Let's ride! Okay. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. So, I'm ready to go down a little bit of a rabbit hole. I really am. And let's just uh, put it out there right now. I want to ask the question that I've asked many times in the past, over the years. It's happened from time to time. And I've asked, are we in the new dark ages? Is this the new dark ages? If we were not, um, if we didn't run the risk of getting, you know, snipped off the air for playing the wrong song, I would have put some bad religion on right now. But we have asked that question quite a bit. Are we in the new Dark Ages? Because that whole idea of the Dark Ages, it carries with it a significant des- a, a significant picture. I think that we all really have as a subconscious uh, as a subconscious thing right now. The Dark Ages it carries a like I said a, a picture of desolation. It for us it's barbarism, it's decay, it's diseases. It's the rotten remains of a once glorious republic reduced to feudal states. Uh, we, we, We know about inquisitions and we know about the general lack of morale. And then suddenly, suddenly, a renaissance. They're just suddenly a renaissance. So, I mean, I, I know that this tells much of the story of modern America, the once great republic the experiment across the sea and now here we are with uh, the, the 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 department of defense <laughs> and their memos and and the medical experimentation going on there and even though we're in the supposed age of information it is hard to know which direction is up at any time of the day but uh, is it possible that we can talk about the dark ages most of what we know um, is it possible that when we talk about the dark ages uh, is is it that most of what we know is exactly just what that uh, that uh, what the american story is is it a story is it just a story and who is telling the story is it just another 1619 project level fabrication how much of what we know about the dark ages is true and uh, and and what should all balance it out well our guest tonight is a, a very thorough historical researcher, and I've been following him, as I said, for a, a while now on Twitter, but also on the Dissident Review. I have linked the Dissident Review on 
the in the description for this episode so you can go check that out on your own where they not only publish incredible blogs online that is shared all throughout the uh, Twitter sphere and, and elsewhere but they are in the print business as well which as you know is very important very necessary another thing that is symbolic these days is the the, the memory holding online and the way that the very Ministry of Truth way where things are disappearing or they're edited in real time and in the in in that same way some of the greatest things that the internet has ever produced thought-provoking things that the internet has ever produced has been lost to an effect similar to the burning of the library at Alexandria which another thing we should talk about tonight but um and here's some of their books too and then we're going to bring Alaric on here you go this is from the dissident review dissidentreview.com there is the frontiers books I don't have any of these yet I must volume one a reclamation and revitalization of the past from the dark ages to occult history pre-modern Ireland to the 1980s at 1980s Afghanistan this edition collects several groundbreaking essays and one never before seen translation all aimed at providing a vision of the past a vision of vitality inspiration pride and greatness and that's a, of course the reason why I was so in intrigued by what we can discuss with the dark ages here tonight because what about it what about our stories whether it be the American founding or the the upheavals and the transitions over there in Europe the Crusades the age of exploration how many of the things that even when I was a child we were still encouraged to be proud of is now something that we should not be proud of and um, and yeah that's what we have on tonight so uh, with that being said Alaric Alaric the Barbarian are you there my friend I I, st I see you hanging out yes sir thank you for having me on oh it's great to have you you know what before we go anywhere uh, can you tell us a little bit about the founding of the dissident review because it's a it's a it looks like a pretty fresh publication I've been following it for a while do you have a hand in its founding uh, yes actually I'm the uh, founding editor of it and it's just about a year old at this point uh, I started it around September of last year with this notion that I might be able to get a couple of essays into print and I've been pleasantly surprised by the amount of sheer talent and interest there is among people outside of the mainstream uh, in putting out just amazing historical research. So we just did volume two, uh, themed Frontiers. That one was, I believe, 11 essays and a translation, and then volume one was eight. So we're about to put out volume three as well. Uh, it's, it's been going great. I'm very happy about it. I am too. It, it's uh, obviously you being a part of it and you being a, a founding editor for for the project. It it must be very proud moment for you. But as far as excitement goes, when I see things, projects like this that have such great care taken in putting them together, and I start seeing the attraction of really great minds that otherwise we're spending a lot of time uh, putting together wonderful threads on Twitter. But you know, it, you, a you have to find these people, and b, depending on what the where the political winds blow, they can disappear and all their work is gone in a nanosecond. And the fact that people like you are starting new publications that are not only talking about current events but history, which is so important because the 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 um, the mainstream tellings of everything, even so-called uh, conservative tellings of history, is is really just lacking and the fact that you are doing something that can be preserved in a physical sense and cannot be deleted that is just always so heartening to me well thank you i appreciate it uh, it's that was the meaningful element of it for me too because i saw a lot of people putting a ton of effort into social media posts that could just get you know nuked instantly and i, I wanted to get some stuff into the real world into physical you know presence where you can't destroy it uh, we've done the same with some republished works as well, some old primary sources, collection by Richard Harding Davis, and then uh, recently a book on naval warfare. Just getting stuff into, you know, making it real is very important, I think, especially with historical discourse, because it changes so much, even if people don't realize it. Yes. Yeah. And, and you know, we're, we have seen history change uh, so much in the, in the, the course of a, of a decade 
So when we th- when we were talking about something like the Dark Ages, which we're going to jump into tonight, where we're being separated by nearly a thousand years at this point, it is uh, you know or going on at that. I know you know it started nearly a thousand years ago. We're, we're going to get into that all that. But if what can be done to us in a decade, centuries is just incredible. Um, and and I guess that's what we're going to just jump into right now. So. I'm going to come from a an everyman standpoint here because most people who hear any reference to the so-called dark ages, it brings up a feeling of lost opportunity, lost technology, where we had a stable, marvelous empire made of marble that has now been burned and looted and it has just, just been cast into the sea and all of its technology is gone. What rose up in its place, of course, Alaric, is the bubonic plague and religious fanaticism and feudalism, uh, which really just thrust humanity into this kind of unhygienic tyranny until the Renaissance just popped up in Florence. So does that sound familiar to you as far as that story goes? Oh, yeah, absolutely. The, uh, The thing about how we interpret the entire era is that it's characterized not just by 10 years of propaganda or 20 years, but, you know, eight centuries of propaganda. Uh, We see rhetoric being integrated into modern things that came up in the 1200s and people just repeat it uncritically without any context. So you end up with this very confused vision of things. However, with that said, I, I think the number one thing that people, whether they know it or not, associate with the medieval era is that one scene in Monty Python and the Holy Grail where they're rolling around in the mud and yelling at the king. Uh, That one keeps coming back. People seem to really have fixated on that due to a general lack of knowledge about the era. And I I think it's sad because the Middle Ages in general were such a, a high point, and we don't realize that they were a high point because contemporarily, immediately after, everybody just said they weren't a high point and, you know, the Renaissance now and then the Enlightenment were the real high point of Western civilization. So both of those movements sort of relegated the medieval era to barbarism and backwardness. Yeah. We just accept it. Oh, yeah. Especially the etymology of the word medieval. I'd love to get a little bit of whatever you have on that there, too, because I've always heard this word, and it's used interchangeably with Dark Ages or the Middle Ages, and phonetically... I, obviously evils in it so you you think of evil yeah. and and it has always been sold as a descriptor in our popular culture for uh, a way to describe or to insinuate that, that you're acting in a cruel or brutal way I'm gonna get medieval on your ass or something like that you know so th- tell us a little bit about the interchangeability of all those of all those those terms and where medieval comes from if you can well the the terminology is really confused among academia and has been for a long time the entire idea that the word medieval as far as i know only came up in the 19th century and it just it's latin essentially for middle or intermediary or just in between which is again relegating the medieval era to something unimportant something that came between two greater things which i think is unfair and Beyond that, obviously, for the average person who doesn't speak Latin, it does sound evil, and the connotation associated with it is just bad and dark and backwards. You know, you imagine guys being, like, tortured and stuff like that, witch trials and whatnot. And uh, it's just kind of sad because for a very long time, the the connotation was, you know, Ivanhoe and chivalry and um, religion and just this, this point of... I want to say refined Christian culture in Europe, but that's been totally subverted out in recent years through media and history, discourse, and education. Hmm. You know, it it almost reminds me of another area in history that I would love to jump into sometime and just learn a little bit more about myself because I'm I'm lacking, and that is the so-called Gilded Age here in the United States. You know, when you when you said the Middle Age right there, this this is this almost like a well, what is this? Well, there was a beginning, and then there is what we have now, and then there's some middle muddle crap that was in the middle. Thank God we just we survived that middle period right there, you know. And and over here, it's it's a pretty uh, forget forgettable time in United States history as well. That eighteen. 18- 75 1877 area right into the beginning of the 20th century where by all measures right there obviously reconstruction was very very rough 
for the South, but I mean, it was a time of economic explosion and prosperity elsewhere, and uh, and, and we don't know too much about it. So there, we're very, we're very. I don't. I, I think we have very myopic views of all chapters in history, especially things that are eight hundred years old. Definitely, yeah. And uh, the the bigger thing is the sort of osmosis of information that comes to you with that, like the the general vibe I, I have no better word for it but the general vibe about how people think about the the middle ages is this you know barbaric backwards dirty dirty is a big one uh diseased sort of repressive era and nobody really tells you at least most people don't get explicitly told in education or media that the middle ages were this time of like mud and disease and backwardness and violence you just sort of absorb it through media you get these individual little pieces and that's the that's the connotation you put together and that's why i'm going to get medieval on your ass has a meaning you know yeah and that that's the sort of thing that i want to address because the idea first of all like uh, i said the etymology is really confused uh the idea of a dark age has been rejected mostly in academia now they don't go in public and say that but most academics that are medievalists don't believe in the idea of a dark age but the common person hears that, hears the Dark Age, you know, anybody except a PhD in medieval history is going to associate it with certain things. And it, in my opinion, it represents a pretty concentrated or concerted propaganda effort against um, Christianity, Western civilization and whatnot, because the, the narrative makes very little sense. It's this idea that Europe went from this high point with classical civilization and Rome, and Rome was this absolute point of glory and then descended into dirt and toil and backwardness, and then all of a sudden conquered the world for no reason. Like, that that does not check out logically, but that is what most people have absorbed through education and media. And I, I, I just like people to have a more nuanced view of the Middle Ages, because I think it was actually a, a high point. I think it was a great era for Western civilization, and yet we sort of scorn it even conservatives like you said conservatives will think of the medieval era as backward because they haven't really seen an alternative view of it right right and of course the alternative view would make them seem like they are in some way uh theocratic and i i think that they should probably stay away from anything that is that is too overtly pro-christian and and that is uh, going to be a major part of tonight's show i do know that much now how about this uh, tell us really quick what years officially encompass the so-called dark ages and what kicked them off like when did when did all of a sudden the lights go out Alaric well it's funny with my name um Alaric the actual Alaric sacked Rome in 410 AD and that's sort of hailed as the beginning of the end for Rome that was the beginning of the collapse of the Western Roman Empire and the collapse of the Western Rome was the beginning of the so-called dark age uh, I, I'd better describe it as late antiquity, but that is generally speaking the agreed beginning of the Dark Ages. And then you have uh, the reign of Charlemagne in the eighth century, the mid to late eighth, or I'm sorry, the early to mid late, uh, early to mid eighth century. And then you have um, basically nothing for some reason until the Renaissance. And as far as most people are concerned, that's the timeline. You know, uh, you have the fall of Rome death, destruction, evil, and then the Renaissance, either the 13th, 14th, or 15th century, depending on the region or your interpretation. So that's up to, you know, 600, 700 years of just oppression and backwardness, apparently. And some people will even take it more extreme and take it further into the, um, until the age of exploration, they'll say Columbus, Columbus's expedition in 1492 was the true end of the Dark Age because Europe experienced economic growth after that. So hmm. you'll have, in that case, it's a, a thousand years, which is absurd. Because, again, there had to be groundwork for that to happen. So then talk about this, th this then, because I, when, I have, when I have looked into, I mean, I've been becoming more and more interested in the, the telling, the, the tale of the Crusades, all of them. Um, and I wanted to know what, what's happening here. 
especially since everybody says, oh, it was just, you know, it was just the, the, the Christian world that was going to try to sack the rest of the world and take all their stuff. And uh, it, it really wasn't anything at all. It wasn't a, a, a counterattack in any way, shape, or form. Europe was not under any kind of assault. But in the lead up, in, when I, in building the foundation for my understanding of the Crusades and being able to reacquire Europe for Europeans, I, I was learning about the disruption, that one thing that led to the so-called dark ages, at least from an economic downturn standpoint, was all about the disruption of, of being able to, at one point, under the rule of Rome, freely navigate throughout the Mediterranean. That trade that was international at that point, as most of the known world was just right there, was suddenly disrupted because of the Moors and, and, and everything that was being changed in the culture. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the things that were perhaps going down fast around the time that uh, Europe was was losing its cohesion? Well, uh, one thing that people tend to not discuss when they talk about the Crusades is the fact that it was, in my view, a, a part of a larger conflict between Christianity and Islam, and that the Middle Ages were largely defined by this like civilizational clash, life or death struggle between Christians and Muslims. Uh, in seven or 710, 709, 710, uh, Muslim armies invaded Iberia, so Spain and Portugal, and from there kicked off a, let's say, 700-year-long war in Spain mm. for control of Spain. The Reconquista is this absurdly long timescale historical event that people tend to ignore. Um, around the mid-8th century, so like 730s, Muslims had actually pushed all the way into France, modern day France, uh, at that point Gaul, and had gone very far north of Spain. And actually in 732, there was the Battle of Tours in which Charles Martel and a very small force of Franks pushed back the uh, a Muslim army of some 70,000 or more. Some people estimated up to 200,000. I don't know if that's true, but a very large army, let's put it that way, of Muslims. And they were basically backed out of France by this one battle. So just from that alone, Muslims controlled a large portion of Western European territory through the, the, the Dark Ages, allegedly. And uh, beyond that, there was a, a considerable amount of piracy, shipping harassment. And if, if you're familiar with the, like, the concept of pilgrimages being super popular at the time, Christians from like Christian peasants, literally everybody did this would go to Jerusalem and holy sites in the Middle East to, you know, worship and to pray. And uh, at the time, uh, doing a pilgrimage was a very dangerous thing. Muslim pirates and bandits and whatnot would harass pilgrims. That's actually what led to the First Crusade, was the harassment of pilgrims. That was the, the number one thing that led to calling for the First Crusade. Uh, people were horrified by that because it was unarmed people going for religious regions. So you have this environment of pretty severe conflict with the Islamic world, characterizing much of the era and the lead up to the First Crusade. Uh, beyond that, obviously, you have things like the plague in the 14th century and whatnot. But yeah, it, it was definitely an era characterized by strife. And immediately after the fall of Rome, I'm jumping around timelines here. I no, know. I understand. <laughs> you, you know, as you're talking about this, just to just to describe and put that into perspective, these 700 to 800 year time period that that really uh, encapsulates a a struggle for one piece of land that, it, that's just an enormous amount of time even just by comparing the the life of the American Union over here it's just an enormous amount of time how ancient Europe is is uh, really something that we we take for granted over here yeah Muslims were on the horizon for a, a very long time in European history where it was a serious threat that Muslim armies might invade and were invading. I mean, the Reconquista was very back and forth, especially if you were in you know, the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, just a, an element of the era that nobody really talks about. Actually, the there's a great book on the topic. Um, I, I won't pretend to know as much as this guy, but the, the scholar Raymond Ibrahim has this book, Sword and Scimitar, if anybody's interested in the idea of Christian Muslim conflict throughout history, that's the best work on the subject. It's absolutely excellent. So what you describe here as a fight for your life, 
for hundreds of years is is actually a, a pretty dark theme for any any kind of nation or uh, collective culture to um to, to really live under and but the the whole idea i mean the main thrust of it being that it was at the it was really at the hands of this um this looming fight this constantly this recurring fight with the islamic faith that is uh, whose decision was it to or or where do you start seeing the uh, the aversion to categorizing much of the problems that were going on during the so-called middle ages the dark ages as a as a, a a real a real threat to the christian world by invading muslims because we don't have we don't have a lot of that over here like i said before the crusades it when you get any uh, a modern a modern education on the crusades nobody describes it as a counteroffensive it's just a it's a it's a it's a christian blight on the known world at that time it was almost un, totally unprovoked and maybe uh, if it were provoked in some way a complete overcorrection over so when do you, when do you start when do we start seeing this in the telling of the histories as something other than uh, europe constantly in a position to defend itself from invaders well uh that element of the history was sort of disregarded with the enlightenment and the enlightenment the enlightenment scholars namely edward gibbon who wrote the decline and fall of the roman empire he he was the one who initially said that christianity led to the fall of rome and then this barbaric dark age he popularized that he wasn't the first to coin the idea of a dark age but he popularized it and other enlightenment philosophers basically took all of the nuance out of the era and described it as this time characterized by religious domination and thus backwardness. By the way, the entire idea of religion equals no progress comes from the Enlightenment. I'm not particularly fond of the Enlightenment, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, they, they essentially took that element out because it wasn't that important to them. They wanted to characterize European history as being, you know, the awesome ancient world and then the backwards Christian times and then themselves the enlightenment scholars as the next you know coming of european greatness which in my view is pretty narcissistic but uh, um that, that that was essentially where it begun and we still echo it today uh, especially with ideas about like islamophobia is bad and we have to you know nobody wants to characterize it because it's touchy you know, they don't want to delve into that because it's a it's an awkward subject to look at uh, Christians and Muslims as being at odds for a millennia long war. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, and as you as I have read and listening to you now about the Enlightenment, the more I am questioning about what uh, we've been told, even in a rudimentary sense about what made the Dark Ages so dark is making me wonder what made the Enlightenment so enlightening. How what how is it, it? It could it be that these are in some ways because you know what we're talking about here is a a time, of hundreds of years of strife of fighting for your own lives and your your ability to to uh, to build and maintain a civilization in Europe. That that is a that is pr still pretty burdensome. But as far as the Enlightenment goes, what? What can you in some? I don't want we want to keep it to the Dark Ages, but can you in some way? talk about their their depictions of of what was what else was going on especially the anti-science aspect of it um from enlightenment mentality i've always read that it was a time of christian fanaticism yes 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 there was invading moors but the moors they were they were actually innovating much more than we ever gave them credit for they gave us they gave us uh, algebra and we had you know all these great innovations they were the biggest innovators of the time and and on the other hand what was left of the roman empire uh, i mean there was there was nothing left of it. they they seemingly forgot how to do anything they couldn't build roads anymore they they were uh, you know it, it was it was a, it was a disaster and all was lost so can you talk about this balance of you know was there any where was all the scientific endeavors where was all the innovation on the european side of things versus what we are are always encouraged to do in in praising the uh, the moors well the the interesting thing with that is how at least i'm familiar with academics framing it is that the christian medieval world was backwards and barbaric and religiously fanatic fanatical but the islamic world was forward-thinking progressive and scientific 
And I, I think that's utterly ridiculous. That's how they tend to characterize it nowadays. Uh, the thing was that the Islamic world received a lot of the Greek texts that were lost in the Western world, which meant that they had a lot of, uh, they had sort of a head start. However, this by no means implies that there was no science in the Western world or that the church oppressed science. That seems to be the conclusion that people draw. However, monasteries, monks, and uh, as well as nobles into alchemy were building the foundations of modern science. So you have names like uh, Albertus Magnus as a like a founder of modern science, and then you have lesser known ones, uh, namely a couple of monks. I want to say the one guy's name was Johannes de Sacrobosco, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, who having lost access to the Greek texts, basically uh, he recalculated the size of the earth. He recalculated the motion of heavenly bodies. You had uh, work on medicine, astronomy. Astronomy was a very big one in the medieval world. Navigation, engineering, things like that. They were absolutely made in medieval Europe, but they were made in monasteries and distributed among uh, a subset of the population. In the Islamic world, you had a, a system of the House of Learning in Baghdad, and some other universities and whatnot. And don't get me wrong, these places made absolutely amazing innovations for their time. However, we sort of uh, mischaracterize them by calling them Islamic because you have something like, uh, you know, people will repeat things like, oh, the Muslims during the Middle Ages discovered the 12 cranial nerves first, they discovered optics first, they discovered that they made the first robots, they made the first, um, you know, all of these innovations. And something like 80% of the time, it was not, in fact, a Muslim that did it. It was a conquered Christian or a conquered Persian. The Persian uh, astronomical tradition was huge, the Zoroastrian tradition. And we just don't give them any credit. We just lump it in with the Islamic world as a way to, you know, dunk on the Christians, those backwards Christians that weren't allowing any science. And it's ridiculous. I mean, it, it outshines the contributions of Nestorian Christians uh, in various places in the Middle East, namely the Academy of Gondashapur. I'm throwing a lot of words out right now, but basically... No, no. Uh, it, yeah, it, the Islamic Golden Age. It's the idea of the Christian Dark Age Islamic Golden Age, right? That's the exact wording that they always use. And I've heard professors say this on social media, on the news, in uh, articles and whatnot. And it's just, it's ridiculous. It's completely unnuanced. And you can tell that they're making it as a political point because they should know better. That's what, that's the, that's the big thing for me when you, when, as you're describing this is there's, I, I'm not here to, I'm not saying that there, there were no wonderful accomplishments made by uh, Islamic scientists or, or, or anything like that during the time. But this, but this notion that there was a just dearth of that kind of, of progress on the Christian European side seems a little ridiculous. Just like the whole idea of all, you know, just everything disappeared after Rome fell. Okay, where where is everything? Oh, every tool just disappeared. And the thing here, the other thing is, uh, it's also totally uh, logical to me that in Islamic in the Islamic world, they will concentrate on their history first. They will prior to, prioritize their history, like every other country and culture will prioritize theirs, and uh, and, and they will be their best hype men. In our case, the Enlightenment. Once the Enlightenment showed up, and and here we are telling our own story. Why again is it this self-deprecating story about? We were the ones that went back to the primordial ooze. We went back to the cave for 800, 900 years and, uh, and, and barely survived. I mean, we, we, at least were, we at least had enough fighting spirit to fight off the greatest inventors of the time, the Moors. So you got to give us some credit there. So the self-deprecation in the telling, the retelling of these stories is what is, is most curious to me. Yeah, it's uh, you mentioned that Islamic historians and histories will be very, you know, patriotic and the, the West, Western nations in general seem to be the only people on Earth that are like anti ethnocentric. You know, we, we want to downplay our own achievements for some reason to, to prove this political point that Christianity is bad and we're actually bad and stuff like that. Uh, it's this it's very subversive and it's usually done by people who are you know, who hate the idea of Western civilization, even if they are, if their entire lives are built in the West and on Western achievement, they, they just hate it. They, they despise the idea of America. They despise the idea of Europe. They despise the idea of Christianity. 
it's a very unhealthy view that leads to these ridiculous historical assumptions that everybody just takes as fact because they're in their universities. Yeah. Yes. And um, and then I'd love to talk about the Renaissance a little bit, too, because now it's making me very curious about that. But uh, another big another big chapter in the story of our climb back into the dark from the high point of of our existence during Rome, Rome's rule is this the burning of the library of Alexandria. That is just, it seems to be one of those things where this was the main repository for everything that we had known about the old ancient world and that once this was destroyed, under whatever circumstances it was, but once it was destroyed, that was almost like enough to turn the lights off in itself. So what kind of work have you done on the Library of Alexandria, the importance, uh, you know, how it was burned, the importance of all that, what was lost, if there was anything recovered. There's so many legends about the, 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 the treasures that, were, that might have been smuggled out over there. But what kind of impact do you think this had on the, on the greater story of the, the Dark Ages? Well, this is a bit of a controversial opinion, but I really don't think the burning of the library at Alexandria was that big of a deal. Okay. Um, <laughs> they, the, the texts there, how it worked is if any ship came into the harbor and they had books aboard, the, um, the librarians would take them, make copies, and it, it depends who you ask, but either they would give them back the originals or give them back the copies. So these were books where there were many copies floating around the world, and granted, yeah, we've lost a lot of texts throughout the ages, but it wasn't like this knowledge completely vanished once the library full of, again, copies was burned. Uh, it was obviously a massive loss of knowledge, but at the same time, it didn't bring the world to a halt or move anybody backwards, in my opinion, at least. Uh, it didn't seem to move the Islamic world backwards. It didn't seem to move the Christian world backwards. Uh, the, the big thing about the library at Alexandria that I find interesting is that and keep in mind, I will preface this. This is not a true story. This is historical propaganda. But there are multiple Muslim histories that record the library at Alexandria being burned by a Muslim general, and they record it very proudly. Um, it's recorded as this great act of destroying anti-Islamic knowledge. I believe the exact quote used was actually um, the quote attributed to this general, uh, Umar, was if what is written in these books agrees with the book of God, then they are not required. If it disagrees, then they are not desired. Therefore, destroy them. Jeez. And yeah, and that's that's not true, but mm -hmm. it was recorded in a lot of proud Islamic histories for a long time. So I think that strikes at the whole idea of progressive Islamic science at the time. They weren't exactly all in on, you know, progress in science. Hmm. Well, I mean, you know, the one thing that you start seeing is that throughout the the millennia, there are certain mindsets, especially when you talk about those who want to go out and conquer or reconquer or whatever the hell it is. There are certain mindsets that continue to show up, even in smaller street thug kind of uh, ways with with Antifa and and, uh, and and other groups over here in the United States or even in Europe. That are just uh, they they are hell bent on destroying all of the all of the uh, the most identifiable pieces of the the current dominant culture, which is obviously in decline. Whether it be statues of historical figures of the past who are uh, very complex outside of the way you know outside of the 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 uh, the, the simplistic uh, reductions um, that 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 are made for all of them, whether they've been uh, a Civil War figure or some kind of an inventor or an explorer. I know you and I will do something on the Age of Exploration that'll be ripe with all this kind of, uh, this kind of wishy-washy coverage. But, um, you know, I, uh, it, it's, I don't even know where the hell I'm going with it now. What, what, what were we just saying? Um, shit. Well, with, with propaganda and uh, destruction of history. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, progressives today like to tear down as much as they can about history. Usually the word used is deconstruction. Uh, I've gotten to a point where if I see that word, I'm immediately, you know, repulsed because it's usually going to be the dumbest thing you've ever seen uh, aiming to make you feel bad about your ancestry or make you feel bad about your culture. 
And that's the the driving goal behind all of this, you know, burning down statues or tearing down statues of like Robert E. Lee or Christopher Columbus or George Washington, any of these, you know, figures. When they tear them down, the idea is to make you feel bad about being connected to them, make you feel bad about them being a part of your culture, them being a part of your ancestry. It's it's the the whole goal is to make you hate yourself. Oh, yes. Uh, Essentially, that's it. I see it as no deeper than that. And the historical element is very strong because most people don't have sort of an immune system against it. They don't have like the psychological security of really knowing history to be able to counter it. So they just go, I I mean, Christopher Columbus was bad. Okay. The six, you know, they, yeah, the 1619 project, Alaric. I mean, yeah. I mean, th- there's nothing more, there, uh, there's nothing more self-defeating than that pile of crap. And then, and then, uh, the, the, I think the the bigger, um, the bigger irony of the thing is that when we come out of the the dark ages that we're talking about tonight, into starting to knock on the door and walk through that threshold of the Renaissance, so many of these Renaissance paintings are actually coming under attack by the activists of the day, who are who want to make some kind of a stand on you know the the state of the climate or something else, and they'll throw tomato soup at a at a at a, at a Rembrandt or or whatever the hell it is. And I just think it's the the irony and the the the, the complete lack of direction is the most disturbing thing about about everything that we we couldn't be so we couldn't be farther from a, a healthy understanding of where we came from and and what this is all about and what our role could really be we're we're really like bottle rockets without the stick yeah the the thing with the destroying paintings and whatnot to me at least it strikes me as a there's a similarity between that and uh, slander of the middle ages and it's just this hatred of beauty and goodness and order and civility. Anything that represents beauty, goodness, order, civility, uh, normalcy, anything like that, these people despise. So if you're on the, the right, I'm doing finger quotes even if you can't see it, but if you're on the right or you're conservative or anything, your enemies despise beauty. They despise goodness. They despise morality. They despise religion. And it comes through in how they you know, publicly show themselves as well as how they discourse about history. And I, I think that's always an important thing to keep in mind when engaging with progressive ideas. Uh, what about the idea the these the nobility of knights? Uh, some people, especially who talk about knights, uh, those who have been knighted, Sir John, Sir Richard, whatever it is, the nobility of knights were a myth. That is what I hear a lot too. That they were they were by and large they were just bullies with swords. It was a title of nobility, but they were the farthest from noble men. And um, and I want to know about that. Is that is there something there that is lost to antiquity? Uh, definitely the the hatred of knights is there. There was a big kerfuffle about that on Twitter a couple of days ago. If anybody is on there, but. Knights in general are hated because they represent, at least in traditional, you know, American and European culture, they represent this idea of chivalry and adhering to a moral code and being strong for the benefit of others and being very Christian. And that that idea, as far as like the left is concerned, can't exist. That never existed, that nobody was ever good, nobody ever believed in Christianity and it made them do good things. So they they slander knights as yeah, let's say, let's see what the words are. Rapists, murderers, dirty. Uh, recently, there's been a lot of like really gross stuff that they try to associate with them. Um, just things like that. They, they try and make out knights to be these awful, vile people. Hmm. And knights absolutely weren't. The code of chivalry was a very potent thing. Uh, granted, yeah, were there knights that abused the fact that they were just about twice the size of everybody else and uh, as well-armed as a modern tank? Yes, of course. But the code of chivalry existed for a reason. It was this aspirational goal of living up to Christian ideals and protecting the weak, service to one's lord, you know, protecting your people, doing good deeds. This was a really powerful belief at the time. And people, uh, you read accounts from... You know the clergy and whatnot to whom knights represented sort of a threat and power and they still extol the virtues of certain knights uh you know like arthurian legend and whatnot was a legend for a reason like that that was a powerful 
piece of not not social programming but of of rhetoric to say this is what knights should be hmm. you know and, and knights very often were and they tried to live up to that a lot of them died you know defending those ideals so I, people trying to subvert it today are just they're just communists essentially yeah no i'm with you i'm with you on that one we have other ones you know here's a question for you that, that this one came from the audience i have quite a few questions from the audience i think are going to be great but since we i just brought up the knights thing this one comes from ruben he says i'd like to know i would like to know alaric's thought on king arthur and his mythical sword did it come from the lady of the lake or removed from a stone the knights of the round table and merlin all that stuff what what about that alaric is there I hear some people dance between the fact that there is there's truth here, there's also myth, there's just good old storytelling and folklore. Uh, where are you on all this? Because it's uh, very important to the imagery of the of the medieval period. See, the thing with Arthurian legend is I'm I'm not by any means an expert on it. There are guys like even I'm on Twitter. Uh, there's a guy goes by Rux A U R O C H S. He is an actual expert on Arthurian legend. I would defer to him, but it, it was a, I, I, I guarantee you that King Arthur was based on an actual person. Um, but again, you're dealing with like 12, 13 centuries of, you know, rhetoric and story. And it, it's the, it's the telephone game, right? So I, I guarantee you that Arthur and the round table and whatnot, they were based on actual people. And then later knights and Kings tried to live up to the example set by King Arthur and these legends. And for that reason, very powerful. Um, there is a quote that basically says from John Steinbeck, you know, historians argue about whether or not King Arthur was real or who he was. But the fact is that he was real to so many people that he might as well have been. It's, it's a moot point. You know, he was this absolutely powerful idea in a lot of people, and he inspired a lot of people to do great things. And for that, he is essentially real in some sense, even if he was a complete construction, which I, I don't believe. But again, uh, unfortunately, that one's just slightly outside of my area of expertise, so I don't want to get... I don't want to say something that's like totally wrong. On it, no, you but you, but you said something that that's pretty um, that leads me to another pretty important question, and it comes from a another listener of the show. His name is Dan, and Dan said, "Is there any credence to the theories of misdating Western history since the Dark Ages, um, so that uh, d due to a scarcity of written records, history, and literature, as you just said, this could be a is it a construction of the culture at the time? Another reason why people have called uh, I have heard people describe this as the Dark Ages is because there is a uh, there, there's a you know a, a lack of written record compared to other high times in civilization. So." Um, do you do you ever have you ever given any thought or looked into this idea that there is there is a lot of misdating of Western history going on during this time because of how the how records were a little bit more scarce than other times in history? Yeah, we're definitely wrong about a lot from the Middle Ages. I, I won't pretend to that we have like a scholarly consensus that's very definite on things. We're definitely wrong about a lot, but that's mostly on the angle of cultural history, in my opinion. And as we discover more texts and more uh, sources, we're going to, you know, fix any issues that we may have. For example, recently uh, the, there was a library discovered. It was actually just one massive book collected by Christopher Columbus's son that was a summary of hundreds of medieval texts that are now lost. So I think as they translate and parse through that, we're going to have a lot of mistakes corrected. Mm -hmm. But largely, um, some of the chronology stuff gets into like Fomenko, uh, if you're familiar, you know, the idea that we, we didn't have like 500 years of Western history. I, I don't necessarily believe that's true just because of the serious amount of archaeological evidence that exists even without the textual evidence. But with that said, we're definitely wrong about a lot simply because we don't have a lot of the texts. He, he, well, here's one for you. This is from an hour ago. This is from uh, Average Joe, Rio Golfler. All right, so it, I, I don't know. This is the first time I'm reading anything like this, and it may it may, uh, it may go into what you just said about certain people's theories on the lost time. But Rio said a 1,000 or so years 
has been added to our history with made up historical figures and made up events and offer very little detail. Some say dates were recorded using an I or a J, not a number one. So the year 1388 was really I-388. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. I've never read this yeah, before. Yeah, that's, that, that's Fomenko. He was a uh, Russian historian who, he has some good points about echoes in history about like um he'll compare the timeline of medieval kings of england for example to kings of jerusalem in ancient history and he'll point out that there's a lot of similarities in the the timelines of their rule and whatnot but at the same time we have so many archaeological sources that demonstrate you know that that's not really true there's definitely something to the fact that um a lot of history has been either like recorded wrong or falsified in some way and and Fomenko's right that we should investigate it more but I, I don't believe in the whole thousand years not there uh he's been pretty thoroughly discredited okay all right well the, I was gonna say a thousand years that's a pretty significant chunk of time to hide somewhere I I, I, yeah, can... I mean he basically believes that the entire middle ages like Fome if, if 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 I'm correct and this is Fomenko's chronology he basically believes that most of the medieval era didn't exist which okay. I, I can't get behind just because of the archaeological evidence. So what about the what about the Merovingians? Now you you talk about you you talk about uh, the Christian world a lot. I take it you're a Christian as, as well. Yeah, I'm Catholic. Okay, same here. And I uh, and I I wonder, you know, there, there's there's talk about conspiracy theories. There's a lot of a lot of backstory to the Merovingians and and uh, and their time in what is, it's definitely within the window of of the the Middle Ages here, but um, what about the lore? Like you know, we, you talk about Arthur before and quests for the Grail and the Merovingian kings. The legend goes that they are direct descendants of Christ and and the, that that bloodline is uh, is very important. Will you ever go into uh, myth and lore like that? Yeah, the, the Merovingians are complicated. I, I, I'm, again, not like a high-level expert on the Merovingians in particular, so I won't go too hard into it. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I know that prior to Charlemagne, the the Gaul, the Gallic world or the Gallic world was or is very poorly misun or poorly understood today. Um, their Their culture and sort of myths and legends are i'd say polluted by the historical record simply because it was so long ago and we don't have that many texts until charlemagne and the carolingian renaissance um as a result i don't i, I don't want to say anything too solid on that just because i don't know it that well uh, I, I try to be super honest with people when i don't know things and that's that's one of the things that i don't know as well so i don't want to um you know, mess with anybody and talk out of my ass. No, I appreciate it. I, I I'm, uh, I can get pretty random with these, uh, with the, with the questioning. I sometimes we, we, we strike gold, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you, you're forthright about that because it's not, it's interesting, but it's not really uh, the, the biggest part of the story. But what I do want to do is because we, we talked about, we didn't talk too much about the bubonic plague, but we kind of understand what's going on there. We talked about the invasions and the 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 reconquering and and then the the counterattacks, the, a little bit on the crusades. Now I know that there's only one crusade that was not sanctioned by the the church. I, 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 am am I right on that? Um, I believe that was the fourth crusade. That was no, it was the third or the fourth crusade where they were all excommunicate eh, excommunicated. Um, which is when it was the fourth crusade because they burned uh, Constantinople. Mm -hmm. If I remember correctly, um, I, my, most of my scholarship on this and my writing on it dealt with the first crusade and a little bit on the third crusade, but I know the, the sacking of Constantinople was a, uh, or is at least seen as a reprehensible act. Um, I, I generally tend to agree that it was sort of unwarranted. That's, def but, that's definitely one of those things where, um, the one I know that the one is the is the the instance where a lot of people who want to just blanket judge and condemn the entirety of the Crusades, that's what they will focus in on. That it was all about a sacking. It was all about you know collecting collecting some kind of spoils of war. That's that's what was the primary 
the primary focus with the trappings of a religious uh, a religious counterattack and and all that but i I, I would love to get into that again sometime with you, but the, I know there's there's more pressing things at hand. It, 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 the biggest thing right now is the Renaissance. I want to talk about the actual coming out of this area, this area of time. Where are we talking about the fruits of the labor? Uh, are we talking about the fruits of the labor that was required to secure Europe at this time of the Renaissance? Was was much of the much of the invasions repelled was much of the the borders restored and it, was that the reason why what was the the, the real what, to your uh, to your uh, standpoint that everything was fertile for a rebirth of all this culture and this art and this philosophy and then of course what became known as the enlightenment what gave it this this leeway to to, to blossom well, with the Renaissance, you had, first of all, the outer stability that you mentioned. You're not, uh, the Islamic threat wasn't as serious at the time. And then internally, you had an economic surplus simply by the fact that 30% of the continent died from the plague. So you have less mouths to feed. You have just less people. I mean, it, it sounds very dark to say it that way, but when you have a ton of people die and the level of resources doesn't change, it, it's an economic flourishing. So you had a ton of surplus that could be devoted towards art and science and whatnot. And then at the same time, in Italy in particular, you had a lot of wealthy families uh, sponsoring artists and engineers and whatnot. I mean, that's Leonardo da Vinci right there, as well as the church sponsoring a ton of art. So the Renaissance, the main thing, at least to me, is the artistic flourishing with the, the new techniques invented and whatnot. So you have proper perspective in paintings. You have far better sculpture. Uh, sculpture that once again approached the complexity and skill of the classical world. That is one thing that I will completely cede was lost during the medieval era to a good extent was sculpture. Um, you didn't have the same level of, you know, figure sculptures of individuals and people and whatnot. Uh, however, at the same time, you did have amazing architecture come out of the medieval era that sort of flourished into the Renaissance and advanced to bigger things. You know, you have the, uh, cathedrals and I believe it was Botticelli's dome in Florence off the top of my head you know so you have these these massive architectural constructions coming out of the Renaissance again due to patronage and economic surplus uh, honestly the Renaissance strikes me as mostly an economic phenomenon that allowed certain elements of culture to advance yeah there is there's a, a certain a certain uh, changing in artistic style um, that everybody, I, I think that's the other thing that, from a very surface level standpoint, if you're looking at the Middle Ages compared to the Renaissance and what started coming out, um, it was a, I don't know, you, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, th yeah. There is a very basic two dimensional style to the Middle Ages where people are depicted in either religious ways or social ways, whatever it is, the, these artistic depictions had taken on a very simplistic, not stick figures, but I, I think you know what I mean. And I, um, I, I think that compared to a, a Rembrandt or a Da Vinci, where it's just in such high, high detail, it, uh, I, I think that's the other thing that just gives people this in, this in, this, uh, this, I don't know, this, uh, this idea that even the artists weren't as good as they were a couple hundred years later, where it was just a, a, a matter of, of style that was, I, I would love for somebody to be able to actually break that down. Why stylistically, uh, they went for a little bit more, I would say, primitive artistic depictions of whether it be like religious events or historical battles and then of course then comes the classical the classical approaches from the the, the later centuries there that's a that's a big part of it too what is represented from the ages in artwork and the the detail that is left behind i i think that's um that is is very important yeah well with the uh, the middle ages you have primarily symbolic art so you have things like spiritual size where important figures are depicted as being like 17 feet tall in compare or you know in comparison to non-important figures that are just sort of in the scene and you have things like the the Bayou tapestry and other famous tapestries where first of all you're limited by the medium of a tapestry it's not exactly easy to paint you know da vinci level thing on a tapestry but it, it's again it's primarily symbolic 
your your recording history like the Bayeux tapestry re uh, records the Norman invasion of England and this was a intended to be a very direct historical work you know where you're supposed to be able to look at it and glean the story of the invasion you know so you don't have the same level of artistic flourish and classical appreciation for beauty in the sense that you do in the Renaissance mm -hmm. additionally uh, for the Renaissance you have the invention of like two-point perspective which came out of, I believe the first person to use a form of it was El Greco, but I could be totally wrong on that. Um, you just have painters starting to innovate with painting in three dimensions, sort of. And that was just a technological improvement that happened. Um, I will say with the Middle Ages, their art, the highest art of the Middle Ages seems to be architecture, to me at least. Uh, Gothic architecture is the most appealing thing to me out of the era artistically. And it was meant to be sort of experienced rather than looked at. You know, you can't experience the beauty of Gothic architecture if you're, like, through a picture. You can't, you don't get it. Because there's also the um, the sound elements of it, the, the scale, the perspective about how you're supposed to view things. It was this very different view on art that we find hard to understand because it's different than our modern view of art, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's like just... how you how you experience a Warhol is fundamentally different than how you experience going to the Notre Dame. Exactly, and I actually had somebody, Catherine, had wrote wrote in a a question, a couple of questions for you. One of them was on this. She she asked, "Why do all modern buildings look like crap, and why don't we know how to build stuff that to last like buildings of of uh, antiquity?" So um, I, I know there's there's plenty of people on Twitter and elsewhere that talk about just about architectural failure and how it really uh, ties into the cultural norms of the time. But uh, how much have you done on this and just the, 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 the way that we've moved away from those classical types of buildings, the Gothic style, which is, you know, uh, you go a couple hundred years after that and all of a sudden we're, we're, we're talking about Art Deco and, and it all kind of meshes very well together, but we are nowhere near that now. I think we're, we're approaching more ugly Soviet-style buildings again. Yeah, with architecture, you're, you're right that there's a lot of people that talk about this very, very well online. Um, I think the, the cultural tutor is a great example on Twitter and yep. elsewhere. But the, the thing with architecture in the medieval era is, you know, people like to say... Yes, we could build the Notre Dame. We could build any of these great pieces of Gothic architecture. We can replicate them one-to-one -one fairly easily with modern techniques. But designing something like that is a different game entirely. Because at this point, like most artisanal professions, uh, architecture and engineering and building were guild items. And in guilds, you have these sort of esoteric secrets to the guild that you're initiated into. So you have, with uh, cathedrals in particular, you have like sacred geometry and architecture that's meant to invoke certain feelings in you that were preserved almost exclusively by oral tradition. And they were just, they were an in-group thing. You know, they're like a, a college fraternity's secrets that they don't share with anybody else. And, and that was an important thing. That was a, a big element of being in the guild was knowing those secrets that nobody outside of the guild knows. And that that's the big difference uh, between architecture like that and modern architecture. We don't have that that idea of um, spirituality to it or esoteric implications to it. We're very utilitarian and pragmatic. I would I would add one more thing to that when we, when we talk about the the spiritual aspects of of modern building or or the lack of spiritual aspects of the modern buildings. Um, when we talk about cathedrals and churches and chapels of the past, there is a certain, and it, it cannot be overlooked, it is not just a for added effect, it is very scientific, the acoustics of these places. When we, I, on this show, we've talked about um, somatics a lot and, and what sound does, sound frequency, how many of these chambers and many of these, these, these churches, they are actually built to create certain very specific frequencies that 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 really do alter mood and really do bring you to new vibrational settings that we can that uh that you can you can really you can feel things change inside your body your body chemistry and that that is something that i think is just so smart and a 
an aspect that's lost to all things because for as for as uh, as as highfalutin as we think we are with our with our popular culture, we really have become dumb, really really dumb, and um, and ignorant to to the way that our bodies and our minds actually work. And you can tell in these older buildings that there was some an added aspect to them that was just built in that was supposed to literally connect to the to the spirit. Well, yeah, that's the the big thing with the medieval era that I think we misunderstand is you just can't get in the frame of mind of being even close to as religious as people were. It's almost unfathomable how spiritual people were in the Middle Ages and how connected to God and religion they were. Uh, And that comes through in the architecture and the art. You know, when we look at it, we look at it through this materialist lens. Whether or not we're religious, that's just the dominant culture right now. You can't escape it you just can't understand the level of devotion and almost like cosmic religious influence that they had. And by the way, the science itself goes back to like of acoustics and religion goes back to ancient Egypt, you know, and I I don't doubt that there were some unbroken elements of knowledge through the ancient world, but you have like the burial chamber of uh, Khufu, if I remember correctly, has these insane acoustics to it that if you sing anything, it will bellow out at this certain frequency and it will create overtones and undertones. And it's insane. Apparently, people who have experienced it describe it as a spiritual experience. And we're talking about, you know, pink-haired archaeologists, the least spiritual people out there, right? And the same thing happens in medieval cathedrals where it's something that you cannot describe materially. You cannot describe it through material terms that exists there as a result of the architecture and to me that strikes uh, that strikes me as the biggest thing the biggest disconnect between us and the medieval era mm. is we just can't get on that same level of spirituality or at least have to try really hard to do the thing that they just lived and perhaps that's because uh, so much of the storytelling of that era in the centuries since has been uh, has been focused on how the the spiritual aspect has, was one of the downsides was one of the downfalls and and again it these these stories these retellings of history are being told by the same kind of people who um, who will depict the uh, events like the French Revolution as a by and large glorious uprising of the common folk against a stifling aristocracy when in reality it was widespread and indiscriminate murder so it's yeah. you know they, they so and, and of course that is a that is a product of the so-called enlightenment we're already we're already in it at that time so it's um it's really interesting to see the stories that are told the evidence that's left behind to the contrary and the tie-ins that we have to modern day, because we're we're really sitting in it. It, it, it describes a lot. It, like for example, the understand the misunderstanding of McCarthyism. Everybody, Republicans and Democrats, they use McCarthyism as a bad thing all the time. The Dark Ages is always used to describe something that needs to be rejected and not studied as well. And um, it, it just goes on from there. It goes on and on from there. Absolutely, yeah. The the study of history is. I'd say probably about 80% the study of propaganda over the centuries. And uh, people today like to pretend that they're immune to the propaganda. And I'm not immune to propaganda. You're not immune to, nobody's immune to propaganda, you know? And it's very difficult sometimes to extricate what you believe about history and thus about yourself from that propaganda. It's that, that's something that's very important to me is trying to, build something that's an alternative to that, to, to, you know, the universal propaganda that everybody experiences about history. That, yeah, that's, um, here's a couple from, uh, that just came in from NJSF. He said, Enlightenment was funded by the Medici Bank and that uh, while Spain took centuries to reconquer, Portugal was done with the Moors in 80 years in just two kings' time. Um, that's coming in from some of the people in the in the chat room there. Uh, well, listen, I, I got to say, Alaric, it, it's been so wonderful to have you on, and I'm already looking forward to the next time. Now, I don't know what will happen from now until October, but I definitely want you back on around Columbus Day to talk about 
Christopher Columbus, namely about how he knew exactly where he was going, and I would love to be able to expand that out to the Age of Exploration, which gets a bad rap just like the Dark Ages do. Um, it, it, so, you know, I uh, that that's my hope here because I really enjoyed this. Yeah, thank you for having me on. This is a lot of fun. Um, this is a this is a topic I could go on about for five, ten hours if you let me. So, well, listen, if there's anything, it, well, let me ask you. I'll, I have two last questions for you. I'll just add a second one then. Um, number one, is there anything that we did not discuss tonight about the Dark Ages that would blow people's minds that needs to be said that we just didn't get to over the course of natural conversation? That's the, that's the first thing. Because I don't want to leave any stone unturned. Technically, I have another half hour. I just don't want to impose on you. Oh, no, you're all good. Uh, the, the thing that I would say is that uh, the Crusades were justified completely and were a primarily spiritual especially the first crusade were a primarily spiritual undertaking rather than a material thing um that's a topic that would be another whole hour of discussion so i won't get too into it but just generally speaking when you hear people say that the crusades were done for you know it's the cynical move for profit and land it was the most unprofitable land in the world people did this entirely almost entirely for spiritual reasons um and beyond that that how do I phrase this? Generally speaking, when you hear about an era in European history being bad, you can trace it back to a couple of scholars out of the 1930s through the 1960s that intentionally aimed to make you think that. Now, that was the Frankfurt School. Oh, yes. And everything is derived from the Frankfurt School with bad scholarship. Generally speaking, those are the two big things. Um, when I discuss this, that people are baffled by, but you know, th th there's a bunch of different rabbit holes, but I'll, I think I'll leave it at those. You know, the, when you, th that's why I've been studying the crusades a little bit more and I can't wait to keep going. But the one thing that I have been able to really settle on and acknowledge primarily is that what's been lost. You, you just said this was a spiritual war and that there was barely, there's no, there's nothing to be profited from with these strips of land that were very, um, uh, they were holy sites and they were very important to the faith. And then of course you saw other, I mean, you can't say that there wasn't anything very important about the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Spanish Peninsula out there and what you're talking about with that with the Moors coming up from North Africa and everything but there was just it, it was definitely a time where people recognized that there was a there was an invasive force that did not care about assimilation that did not care about being peaceful and did not care about cohabitation or anything like that they didn't care about that and still in that weakened state post collapse of the Roman Empire here was a people from all across the continent that were in different regions different local customs and all that who were still bound by a faith and they acted in the biggest I mean it's it's pretty badass to get yourself together and say we're going to war and it's um and it's for a reason bigger than ourselves and th that just that kind of mentality it is so beaten out of us it is so beaten out of us. If you're reading the news now, what both hemispheres with what's going on with all the these completely fomented migrant crises that are the most unnatural things ever, it is a, a war, it is a reconquista that has, at this point, not required an enti a, a, a shot fired. And, and the fact that we see it, and instead of if some people get upset and some people see it for what it is, but for the most part, it is a self-deprecating, self, uh, defeated culture of people who are just like, oh, well, well let's find the, the upside to, to all the invasions that are going on now. Think of the cuisine. And they always talk about how all the, the, the best... It's the food. It's the <laughs> foods. The food's going to be amazing in the, in the new neighborhood. So it, that's the thing that gets me, Alaric. It's just to, to see that that, that acknowledgement, that, willing to, that willingness to self-preserve is just gone. Yeah, the, the thing with... Um with how that ties into history for me is that it was a uh, the knightly class essentially that rallied together to oppose this historically and there's a lot of discourse and propaganda out now that says that knights were awful and everything sucked and peasants you know had these awful lives 
if there's one thing that I can say about the medieval era that most people don't believe inherently without realizing it, it's that most of these people loved their lives. They enjoyed what they were doing. You know, knights loved being knights. This was something that they took great passion in and were extremely, uh, let's say, hyped up about was, you know, we are going to push back this this threat. We are going to, you know, demonstrate martial excellence. We're going to fight for God. This wasn't an empty thing like it is nowadays. The idea of saying, you know, we're going to do this in the name of God. This was not empty rhetoric. This was real. And I think that's probably the number one thing that people try to subvert out is pretending that everybody was just this cynical, self-interested economic actor that had no belief. Now, this this was 100% real, and it is a healthy thing to have that kind of faith and belief. Very well said. I guess the, the, the bonus question I have for you is that um, in all the history that you study, uh, what historic figure or figures, if you can throw a couple out there off the top of your head, what which historic figures would you love to see on Twitter? Would it be Charlemagne? Would it be someone like that? Who would you love to see on Twitter with their own account back from the dead? Hey, see, the thing about Charlemagne is that I don't think he would ever post a tweet. He'd be too busy doing stuff. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it, though he would be cool. Um, just in terms of thinkers, I feel like uh, Hemingway would be terminally online. Oh, boy. I feel like Hemingway would just be constantly yelling at people on the Internet. Yeah. But more historically, um, Petrarch, the entire like the the word, the words Dark Age come from Petrarch and it basically came out in this this text that was the contemporary equivalent of like a, a dunking thread on Twitter where he was just yelling at his fellow scholars. So I'd love to see this. Yeah, he'd, he'd be a he'd be a funny guy on social media nowadays. Well, let's see what we can do. You, you never know. You never you never know what we can arrange these days, Alaric. But I really appreciate it. And for everybody at home, uh, seriously, the the publications on the Dissident Review, you got to go check them out. Bookmark it. I have the link in the description below. Go and find Alaric on Twitter. You can click through on all those on all those uh, those uh, those articles, and you can find it just that way as well. I also have him tagged in all of my promotional tweets for today. So go and uh, and check him out. And Alaric, I'm looking forward to the next time whenever that may be i appreciate you having me on and i am as well all right have man. a good night have a good night take care you too there you go alaric the barbarian what a civilized conversation we just had with a barbarian i'm going to be back in just a second we're going to take a quick intermission and then your calls your thoughts some thoughts i have over here and 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 that'll be it for a nice wednesday wednesday is almost in the books don't go anywhere. It's intermission time, folks. Time out to press the like button. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to intermission. We'll, we'll be right back. Yeah, intermission. Quite frankly. 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 We all support. Quite frankly. Not quite. Quite frankly. Let's go, Brandon. Quite frankly. In Roma, Italia. Quite frankly. You're going on Frank's show tonight? I want to get a Coke. Can I get a Coke? 
So everybody watch, quite frankly, with Frank. Quite frankly. How dare you? All right. That was great. I knew it would be. You know, it was. I was watching last night. And, you know, whenever I, whenever I, I get home and I'm just hanging out, and if Lauren goes to bed early, or if we're just sitting around, and we want to put something on, and there's a number of things we could just go to in a pinch. And sometimes just the Sopranos, just put anything on Sopranos. And I, I was hanging out in, in season six for a while, and Lauren just threw on season four. Is that all right? So just press play on something. And what do you know, last night, it was the Christopher Columbus episode. I said, you know, this is just so, this is so perfect, continue, uh, considering the conversation I knew I was going to have this evening. And it's just, that's, it's just rich, rich with examples of this modern, this modern war, civil war of historical differences very interesting and, and, and of course all placating oppressed people or created special interest groups and all that you have the the Italians who wanted to honor Columbus the Native Americans Native Americans who see him as a devil and then of course you know hash the Jew commiserating with the Native Americans until of course the Native Americans start comparing Columbus to Hitler because then that minimizes the Jewish Holocaust, and then you can't have that. And then, of course, they're ass, they're they're at, they're at each other's uh, neg- necks, and that's it. So yeah, I think I think it was just so perfect that, that popped up last night, thinking about what we're we're talking about tonight, and we are being stuffed into a new dark age. I think so. I think so. You have to go to play, but the, it, the good thing is that we have the the most important historians of our time are getting together, they're getting together, they're writing books, researchers, um, anthropologists. It's great to see everybody just doing the heavy lifting themselves, and I think those are the ones whose reputations are really going to, uh, are, are really going to be important in the years and the centuries to follow after this. Whatever the hell happens to us, somebody's gonna be able to analyze what the hell we've done and who the real bad actors are. Because all those political biases of right now, those are going to be so long since evaporated. There's going to be no reason, absolutely no reason to cozy up with one side or another. You can just see things for what they were because you're not going to be politically or emotionally attached like everybody is today to all the nonsense that's going on. So, And that that in itself makes learning so much fun because then you're actually seeing a well-rounded story there. A well-rounded story. Okay. 914-200-0269. That's 914-200-0269. You get two different ways of plugging it. All right, let me go and make sure that we have everything well. Yeah, we have a couple of super chats over here. Man, they can't. Well, whoops. Here we go. First one up is from... I hope these all aren't from Katie Sky. Three duplicates. They all say the same thing. Excellent show tonight. Well, Katie, I hope that you didn't... Just make sure you didn't get... Um... Oh, wait. There's a duplicate from Stostube, too. Can everybody make sure that you didn't get double charged or triple charged? I don't know what's going on here. But thank you both. Excellent show tonight, says Katie. And Stostube says, just a super chat contribution coming your way. For the nightly listen. Thank you, sir. No, thank you. I'm very happy to have everybody watching and enjoying themselves. Thank you, NJSF, for your in the middle of the show super chats. We have another one over here from Fredo Awakening. It says, fascinating conversation. I'm glad you finished with the historical figure on Twitter question versus the Chinese, oh, the the Chinese, the cheese on deserted island question. Uh, Look forward to you having him back on. Yeah, well, listen, the cheese on a deserted island question is just for certain types of people. I don't know. 
this is somebody who you know, you're talking about dealing in history. So this is a little bit more appropriate for him. But yeah, whenever they come on, whenever he comes on next, it'll be great. Even if it is in October, it's going to be October next week. So let's be honest. The fact that it is the the last the last week and a half of July right now is obscene. So it doesn't matter. Foxhole on quite frankly TV. Sean Joe, thank you. Cautious Observer, thank you. Porpoiseful. Patriot Joker says, can you ask your guests if there's anything to the theory that the Dark Ages never existed? Well, from the lost time theory, he does not seem to subscribe to that at all. But from the, the aspect of we've been lied, we've been lied to and told a story about the Dark Ages that makes them worse than they were. Not that it wasn't a challenging 800 years or so, which in itself makes it a, you know, a time of flux for sure. You know, when you have to spend all that time fighting for your life, then there is a there's there's an aspect of that that is that sets it apart from other times of peace. But I think that we got I think that we got a little a good balance of all that tonight. I hope we did at least. Chai Possum says second granddaughter Juniper May was born at 1.37 p.m. today, weighing in at 6.1 pounds and 18 inches long. She's a stunner. I'm so happy for you. I'm so very happy for you and your family. And welcome to the crew, Juniper May. You know, Lauren and I and the baby, we all went to a friend of ours birthday, well, a a birthday party for his two-year-old son, Johnny. And we went there over the weekend and they they just had a newborn baby, um, baby girl. So Johnny has a, has a, a, a baby sister now. And as soon as I rolled up to the place with Lauren, Johnny and the little baby girl, Martina's uh, mother, came up to our passenger side window where Lauren was and just to say, hey, what's going on? And telling us where we can park and all that stuff. And I said, what is, you know, I I protested a little bit about what's going on with this this second child of yours. I didn't even know that you were pregnant. And, you know, and uh, she said, she joked, I don't know if she's joking about this, but she said, oh, funny thing, uh, uh, she was conceived w- during your show. I said, what? You know, I asked that question of you guys, Have you has a child ever been conceived during, quite frankly? I mean, obviously, I, I'd be a little bit of a distraction. It's not like I'm looking for that, but it, it, has it happened? According to her, one thing led to the other, and I was just, uh, you know, I, I don't know what the hell we were talking about on the show. But I guess I started some kind of a conversation, and now their 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 family has grown by one. And I'm really happy about that. Congratulations to all the new babies out there. Okay, Robert Sarns, thank you. It's great to have you there, Robert. Sean Joe, Witchy Poo, Stone Roller, Tempo 420, Captain Flint. Great to see Captain Flint in there. It was good to have a call from him the other night. And J2 Dank. Great, great stuff. Thank you, everybody, so much. All right, what else do we have? Anything else? Let's take some calls. 914-200-0269. Let's get on into the the Gilded as well. Take some call. We don't need the sleep divorce line anymore. Get out of here. We don't need the serial killer talk line anymore. Get out of here. But you know who is in there? Hold on. Switch over to the phones. I know I'm about to get kicked out. Here we go. All right, Albert, what do you got to say about tonight? Do you have some kind of uh, history lesson for us? Yeah, the uh, the Dark Ages. You got me thinking about, you know, because like the guy was saying, there's like a lot of history that's rewritten. And um, I don't know. It seems like everything is is fake now as well. And uh, there's a myth I wanted to get over, too, is because it keeps coming to me when I I keep having clients ask me, do you you know uh, this guy or do you know uh, that guy? Nobody wants to work anymore. How many times have you heard that? Oh, I've heard it a lot. Yeah, and and I hear it a lot, too. But then if, you know, common sense says if you go to the... you know the national insurance companies and whatever they said that all cause mortality is up between 40 and 45 percent so that's like having a room with a hundred people in it 
And then 40 to 45 of them are just gone. I don't think that people just don't want to work. I just think that they're fucking dead, <laughs> you know, and we don't have people to replace them. You, uh, Am I not making sense? Uh, you, well, you are. You have a lot in common with Robin McCutcheon. Uh, she, when we were talking about, it was sometime, I think it might have been 2022, the, 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 the last half of 2022, uh, or, or no, 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 no. It might have been right around February or something, right around the State of the Union, when they were ro rolling out all of their fake job numbers again and talking about how, th right. how great things were. I, I, I believe that we were talking about this, and Robin brought up those numbers, too. She brought up the insurance. She brought up everything. And yet there is a, an issue here. People are being incentivized to not work because there's a lot more to be gained from government assistance and we know what they wanted how they want to turn that into universal basic income that they're testing that the the, the digital currency from the fed is it is is all lined into that as well but robin is right on the same page with you and thinking that a good portion of people who would be working if they were alive are no longer here well, or they're or they're just totally trash. Like uh, uh, an owner that I talked to today. I mean, it's like everybody I know knows four to five people that are either dead or just like incapacitated. You know, just messed up foobar. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I just wanted to get that in people's heads that it's not. I, I, I agree that they're incentivizing people not to work and especially like the newer people coming up. There's a lot of newer people um, that are coming up that are messed up too and younger people that, that were killed. And like, you know, you touched on something too. You said, you know, during the, uh, uh, the French Revolution, it was just like people dying all over mass murder and it sound it's starting to sound a little familiar i don't know is history repeating itself i just guess i'll leave it at that but that's the main thing i wanted to get across is let's stop talking about how people don't want to work and maybe start talking about how many people have been murdered uh, that's a uh, that's a very big dark question and I, and I don't know I let me I, I just thought of something else too I didn't know if you heard about it but uh, I heard about it this morning I'm probably I'm usually a little bit late to the game on most stuff but I just heard this morning that like the uh, the indemnification for all the doctors that gave the shots the government just came back and said oh by the way none of you are indemnified and I think that that's you know that has a great possibility of being the next big thing thing of getting rid of the whole medical thing because like all these doctors that gave out all these shots even if they were you know had their best intentions or whatnot they're all open to liability right now and they're probably going to get sued out of existence or just quit and the next couple years we're th that's going to be an issue as it as it occurs to me okay well the, it that that would be a uh, that would be a, a big big thing right there thank you albert they deliberately open up all of the water carriers to to some sort of legal action and what does that do put them out of business put them in jail does that continue to shrink up the pool of uh, emergency workers that are work, you know, that are servicing everybody else? I, I don't. Uh, I can see that becoming a problem. But damn, they were so loyal in the way that they carried water. You'd you'd think that they would be, they would stick around a little bit more. All right, nine one four two hundred o two six nine. How has this brought up thoughts in your head about other things we might have been lied to about in in uh, in history? Let's go to. Uh, is this Lindsay? Hey, it's Jack, Frankie. What's going on, Jack? Good to have you on. What's up, buddy? I did my homework tonight. I called my father-in-law, who is from Manchester, England, one of the smartest people I know. And uh, he said Charlemagne was the key to all of the medieval times, the dark times. He said he brought education to the common folk, even to the royals. Only the Catholic Church knew how to read right you know and new literacy oh so so that that's it charlemagne is the uh is is top tier then that's what he tells me and i kind of believe him i mean he is very very smart and um 
He said the, the time you were, I, I don't know what he said between Columbus, there was like a blank time. He said that was the Vikings. That's the 13th century when the Vikings came to England and pillaged people and came to the Americas hmm. up until Columbus. Charlemagne, that's something I, that, that is a, uh, that is a figure I need to start buying some books on, or at least getting my hands on some, some really, um, well-rated documentaries that people say are, are pretty fair. That's a guy, that's a guy I want to look into. We share a birthday, Charlemagne and I, April 2nd. Yeah, yeah. And, and your song should have been Kid Charlemagne by Steely Dan. Ah, well, they, thank for you. this evening. Hey, this is a wonderful, wonderful call. Thank you so much for this. Have a good one, thank you. All right, take care. Let, more like that, 914-200-0269. It's 10 to 9. We're going to only be on for a couple more seconds. because, And I, I don't know what we have planned for the Rabbit Hole Wednesday, but I did tell Abe and Cody at QuiteFrankly.tv for QFTV After Hours tonight, and I said, listen, anything you got on the Dark Ages, anything you got on the Age of Exploration, the Crusades, Put that into the mix tonight. So I, I hope that they got the that they got the production notes. Let's take a call from Dean. What's going on, Dean? Frankie Val on the drums. Hey, My what's going on, man? Hey, 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 dude! I don't want to screw things up. I'm going to go ahead and put you on speakerphone, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to crank the show up in the background. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you for considering the show. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, so Frankie, I've been meaning to call in for a while. So book club this time around mm -hmm. with uh, with Charlie and uh, Shoeless Joe, the great pick by the way, loved it. Thank you. Um, so I read it back in high school, and I didn't read along with you guys, just for that reason. I just thought it'd be cool to listen to you guys uh, talk about you know the book and listen to what people had to say in the thread and whatnot. And dude, the nostalgia, wow. It was, it was like I was walking uh, through the through the hallways of my high school again. It was amazing. You know, uh, you, you know, Dean. I had just received an email from somebody in the audience who knew, who uh, who knows W P. Oh, knew W P. Kinsella, the 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 author, died some time ago. But I received an email from someone who knew W P. Kinsella and actually worked alongside of him to, to write his biography. And I got some amazing inside baseball on on this. And uh, one of the things I'll share with you and everybody else out there is that when I got got together with Charlie for that first book club session for um, for Shoeless Joe, if you, if you watch the episode so you know, you heard me say, you know, uh, Charlie, if if all I read was the first chapter, I would say that this is the most complete, amazing yep. short story, short, yep. short a, com story. A, com yeah. a complete short story in itself that is just so beautiful, it can stand alone on its own. And what did right. this, what did this guy tell me? He informed me that that this was that that first chapter was a short story called Shoeless Joe comes to goes to Iowa and that it was because of that short story that he was he was pushed to expand on it and to yeah. and, and to make it a bigger thing I said well I, I'm just that I gave myself a little pat on the back for acknowledging a yeah. per, a perfectly crafted story right. oh god that that first chapter that tore me yeah. apart it was amazing yeah, dude, that that book is a great book. But okay, so more 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 to what I'm trying to get at here. That first episode you did with Charlie, mm -hmm. talking about the book and all that stuff. He was talking about uh, his duties as a uh, an intern at the Rockies. You know, uh, washing jock straps and taking players to the airport and whatnot. You know, and then he said something about uh, being in the equipment room and rubbing some oil on some baseballs and whatever else. And Frank. Do you know what your response to that was? What? I knew there was somebody rubbing those balls down. I said that? And I just, you said that? Yes, you did. And I, right away, I I was like, you can't get away with that, Frankie. What, I did? It, yeah. Okay, listen, do me a favor, Dean. Do me a favor. I'm telling you, Frank, you did. You, you said I knew there was somebody rubbing those balls well, down. Well, do me a favor. Dude, Frank. Do when, when you have people like me and Mark Swan and so many others 
like us and your audience, you 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 can't say shit like that, bro. Listen. Just do me a favor, <laughs> Dean. Do me a favor. You got to go and find find this clip, and just send me okay. send me the timestamp, and I'll play it on the show on Friday. I'll, I'll go and I'll, I'll play it back on Friday, and I'll see exactly how I said it and what's going on there. If it's a, if it comes out as bad as you say it did, just go and find the timestamp and email it to me, okay? And I'll play it on the show okay. on Friday night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was actually going to suggest that you know Cody or. Or uh, or Abe or somebody go find guys. I don't, you know, I'm not huge on technology, but yeah, I'll go find. I'll go. But you said you upload them up up to uh, YouTube. Yep. Right? Yep. It's all public now. I'll try, so. I'll, I'll try and go find it and uh, and I'll, I'll give you the timestamp. Thank you so much, Dean. I'll talk to you soon. But I just. All right, Frank. I thought it was funny, but <laughs> no, all right, brother, if, if that's if that's exactly how it, it happened, you're right. It is funny. Just like last night. Just like last night. That our our sweet amazing melissa who called in about her survival stories in bed with her husband with the with the the rem cycle disorder um who who did made the the big mistake of saying that she had to beat him off to make it all stop you know, I, I, as soon as she said i said she's so sweet this is such an innocent moment but i know this chat room she you can't say that you beat off your <laughs> you can't say that you can't say, you can't say that not in front of the no no I double you have no quick you have no clue how quickly my mind has to work sometimes to choose language if I want to if I want to make sure that I and I have something to say and I want it to be taken seriously my mind has to work so quick to choose neutral language knowing that everything I'm about to say can be completely destroyed can be completely destroyed if I pick the wrong words. Here, I'll, this is this is it right here. It was it's actually hold on. Um, somebody made a clip of it. I think Al Gorbachev made a clip of it last night, and I just put it up on the Telegram. I haven't shared it around yet, but uh, let's see here. Hold on a second. So we've been married forty years, and my husband got diagnosed with uh, REM disorder. And basically, he has kicked me, he has choked me. <laughs> Good thing I grew up with three brothers, because I just beat him off. Gee. But he, <laughs> wait, wait a second. But he, and you can tell right, right there. At, at that point, at that point, it's one of those things where I'm just like, oh, that's it. The chat room has her now. Poor Melissa, the chat room has her. She's in the deadlights now. She's, <laughs> there's no bringing her back from this. <laughs> he has uh, sleep apnea, but the oxygen doesn't work. Good thing I grew up with three brothers, because I just beat him off. Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, I, I know you all heard it, too. But uh, that was nice. Yeah, it, 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 a wonderful call. That was, it was one of the best calls of the night, but I, I just knew it. I said, oh, boy. All right, yeah, I just got confirmation from the guys over at the, quite frankly TV. We got Dark Ages and the Crusades tonight on quite frankly TV, the after hours, and I hope you all enjoy yourself. Hope you go all you all enjoy yourself. And tomorrow night it's going to be another good one. Seven o'clock will be live right here in the studio, and sitting somewhere across from me over there on the other side will be uh, Bill Bean. And whatever guest he brings along, hopefully it's not a demon. And we're going to be talking about we're going to be talking about exorcism, his work, and a ton of questions. And remember, you still have time right now to go to quitefrankly.tv, hit the forum button, and pinned to the top of the forum is a uh, is a, a, a pretty fresh thread about demonic possession and any kind of question you may have for the uh, the exorcist. Ask anything ask anything you can be a skeptic you can come from any angle uh, i have no skin in this game it's just a conversation i've been wanting and i'll, I'll have more in the future because i i would definitely like to talk to a catholic exorcist no doubt but um because the the roman right really um really interests me a great deal but uh, uh reverend bean seems uh to be a, a man of 
great enthusiasm and a good personality, and I think I'm going to be able to have a nice conversation with him. So thank you guys so much. Thank you again to Alaric the Barbarian. Go check him out on Twitter, and go check out the Dissident Review. That's all linked in the description of this episode. And that's all I have to say. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. We'll see you tomorrow. Oh, wait, wait. Let me just make sure I didn't miss anybody. No, Super Chats are good there. We're clean on... Oh, no, 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 no. We had one more come in. Fredo Awakening says, You pose a great question with the what else have they lied to us in terms of history. Mine is what have they been truthful about? Seems we get a lot more BS and accuracy. Every war, space, etc. Oh, there's plenty. There's plenty, you're right. Thank you so much, everybody. I will see you tomorrow. I'll catch you on the flip side. Quite frankly, is filmed before a live studio audience, and now our super chatters, starting with Katie Sky and Stostube in triplicate. And thank you to Fred Awakening and NJSF for your wonderful contributions over on the Rumble Rants. We will see more of you guys and gals tomorrow, I'm hoping. And then over on uh, Pilled Foxhole, I have released the scratches, so enjoy all your prizes, ladies and gents. I will see you in the chat room on QuiteFrankly.tv in just a few minutes, and we can continue our education into the evening. Bye-bye. Take him away. I'm going to go home and sleep with my wife.